25 years ago was the last time that a Williams Formula 1 car finished in the top spot of the Drivers' or the Constructors' Championship, which is a very, very long time ago. The end of the 1990s dominance enjoyed by the team that saw them win the Drivers' and or Constructors' Championship in 1992, 1993, 1994, 1996 and 1997. Notice how I've been saying, and or. I'm well aware as to who won the Drivers' Championship in 1994, but Williams won the Constructors' Championship. I mean, that was all dubious circumstances, but that's a whole nother kettle of fish. And the car used in that season 25 years ago, way back in 1997, was the Williams FW19, which is the first episode in a different format of my Motorsport History series where I do a spotlight on the cars rather than the events. Because I've got a load of these 3D models sat on my computer not doing a lot, so... Might as well use them. In 1992 and 1993, Williams exploited the new technologies when it came to things like traction control, a device that mitigates or flat out eliminates corner exit wheel spin. They also had active suspension, a device that kept the car at the perfect ride height throughout the race, even as the fuel burned off. And in 1993, they went the whole nine yards and added fully automatic gear shifting and even anti-lock brakes. So by 1993, all Alain Prost and Damon Hill had to do was point the car in the direction they wanted to go, and floor it. Well, yeah, not as literal as that, obviously. And admittedly, the 1993 car was not as dominant as the 1992 car. Alain Prost didn't get along with this computer-controlled weapon, and Damon was in his first full year of F1 racing, and also had that smooth driving style. By contrast, the gizmos on the 1992 car suited Mansell's aggressive style a lot more, and in addition, by 1993 the other teams such as McLaren had brought their own systems, and by the end of that season it's widely believed that the McLaren active suspension system was more advanced than the one used by Williams. And with Senna having an aggressive style like Mansell, Senna was able to lob the car around harder and have it do what he wanted it to do, while Prost was still driving like it was 1990. Williams would win the Constructors' Championship in 1994 with the FW16B, a car that was hastily put together around the snap regulation change for the Spanish Grand Prix. But 1995 was a less successful season. Because of Williams bottling it so hard and Damon being inconsistent, Schumacher and Benetton went on to win both titles. But the 1995 FW17 is kind of where the genesis of the FW19 began. It was the first Williams car to utilise the high nose concept, something pioneered by Tyrrell's Harvey Postlethwaite in the early 90s to try and direct more air under the car as teams tried to claw back any ground effect they possibly could. Cars of this era ran stupid low to the ground, almost too stupid low to the ground as the bottoming out theory is one of the many put forward when Senna had his fatal accident. In a Williams, as it so happens, but once again, that's a whole other kettle of fish. The FW17 was regarded as being the fastest car in qualifying trim and had the best overall chassis and aerodynamic packages, but the car just wasn't there in the race, and Schumacher would have the pace on those longer runs. This, coupled with the fact that Hill, Coulthard and Williams kept messing it up, it meant that Schumacher had an easy run of things in 1995. So going into 1996, they took the best bits of the FW17, left them as they were, and fixed the rest of it. Pit stop strategy was top of the list of things to sort out outside of the car, and the new FW18 had to take into account the new safety changes for 1996. Aero deflectors in front of the rear wheels were banned, the high cockpit sides were introduced, cockpits were made wider and longer and front wing end plates along with the nose cones were made blunter. The McLaren MP410 that ran in 1995 had a very characteristic bullet style nose cone, as did the 40 team for that matter, but for 1996 they had to be made rounder. But beyond the safety changes that altered the car radically around the cockpit section, the rest of the car was well, pretty much the same. Adrian Newey and his design team managed to get Hill and Vilna to sit lower in the FWA team, which improved the centre of gravity and therefore improved the handling. And because Alesi and Berger had gone from Ferrari to Benetton and then Schumacher had gone from Benetton to Ferrari and taken half of Benetton with him, it meant that Williams was in a prime position to absolutely walk the 1996 Formula 1 World Championship. And they did. They had the Constructors' Championship won by Hungary, and Hill and Villeneuve had a scrap right until the final race of the season. But by the end of 1996, Damon Hill and Adrian Newey had both left. Now, contrary to popular belief, Damon was not sacked. He'd merely been the victim of circumstance. Following the poor 1995 season, Frank Williams had signed Heinz Harold Frentzen to start when Damon's contract expired at the end of 1996. And with Villeneuve contracted until at least the end of 1998, 
Damon was surplus to requirement, so he took up a seat at the Arrows team for 1997. So Williams didn't have Adrian Newey for 1997, but the basis of the car was still there. Newey was on gardening leave prior to joining McLaren full-time for 1998, but Jeff Willis and the team that replaced Newey managed to take all the good parts of the FW18 and try and improve on them for the 1997 season. The main thing they did was basically just make the car a little bit lighter, and that really paid off, because in qualifying, Villeneuve was 1.7 seconds faster than teammate Frentzen. Part of it was due to the fact that Frentzen couldn't get to grips with the car. He couldn't get it set up how he liked it, and the performance of the Williams was such that it didn't matter that the driver and car couldn't get it together. Villeneuve also said that while he said it was his favourite F1 car he'd ever driven, it was like driving on ice a lot of the time. But you can assume that because of his experience in kart, he knew how to tame a car that just wanted to slide all the time on power. The other part was that the tyres of 1997 had reached ludicrous grip levels. Braking distances had been shortened and the late brakers like Villeneuve and Schumacher could stamp on the brakes and get the car pulled up with time to spare, while others were struggling to adapt. Bring in the tyre war between Goodyear and Bridgestone that had started that season and you're on for a competition for who can brake the latest. But this improvement in braking distances put extra wear on the brakes. Now in the cooler European climate that's not too much of a problem but in the heat of Melbourne it was going to be a problem, and Frentzen found out firsthand when his brakes packed in three laps from the end of the Australian Grand Prix. Villeneuve had already been punted out of that race by Johnny Herbert, so it left David Coulthard to pick up the spoils, meaning that he'd somehow won in a McLaren, and it was probably the most popular win in a very long time. Villeneuve would bounce back in Brazil, taking the win, but Frentzen would have a very bad race. He finished, but he was down in ninth, and in those days, ninth place handed out no points the points would only go to the top six. In Argentina, Frentzen's clutch failed after three laps or so, so it was three races and no points for Hill's replacement. In 1996, Hill had retired at Monaco thanks to his engine blowing up due to an oil leak. Spain was driver error. Silverstone, he had a rear wheel bearing fault or something along those lines, and at Monza, that was also driver error. Clattering one of those tyre stacks at the FIA, in its infinite wisdom, had installed at the first and second chicanes. Villeneuve, meanwhile, had spun off through driver error at Brazil, got wiped out by Badoa's 40 at Monaco, and had a wheel-bearing fault in Japan like Damon had at Silverstone. There was also the San Marino Grand Prix. They had to retire the car late on in that race, but he was classified 11th due to finishing 90% of the race. It was one of the Clarence that took off his front wing or punctured his wheel or something along those lines. In 1997, however, it was a little more concerning. Villeneuve's retirement at Melbourne wasn't his fault. At Imola, he lost his gearbox, but Monaco was driver error. Canada was driver error, and Hockenheim also driver error. With the exception of Monaco, where JV had slipped down to 8th from a bad start, it's a lot of lost points. For Frentzen, though, he lost his brakes in Australia, but was classified 8th due to completing 90% of the race distance. In Argentina, he lost his gearbox, but Monaco was driver error. Silverstone, though, he stalled the car, started from the back of the grid and then got punted off by Verstappen, and then at Hockenheim, he was punted off by Irvine. Then his final retirement came at the Hungarian Grand Prix, where he had a fuel leak. So for Frentzen then, it was mostly bad luck, but it looks like that JV was doing his best to bottle the whole season. Now there is the Japanese Grand Prix in that little list of results that I've put up on your screen for you as well, and JV was disqualified from that race for supposedly failing to slow for waved yellow flags during practice. Now here's where it gets a little bit contentious, because in that practice session, nine drivers went through that section. Nine drivers failed to slow. Two of those drivers were Villeneuve and Schumacher but only Villeneuve was penalised for it. So Williams raced under appeal in Jerez, and it was the infamous race where Villeneuve, Schumacher and Frentzen all set exactly the same time. And then there was the famous collision between Villeneuve and Schumacher on lap 42 that resulted in Schumacher being kicked out of the entire championship. Now that story was one of the first ever episodes of Storytime, so I might have to revisit that one. It's a fun story. Williams had by far the best car for 1997, Ferrari was starting to catch up and Schumacher was using his talents to catch up as well, but Williams still had the competitive advantage in terms of the overall package. But the problem was you had two drivers that just weren't quite there. 
on one hand, you've got Williams number one, driver one Williams, John Newhouse, whatever you want to call him, who was you know bottling it at any given opportunity. And on the other hand, you've got Heinz Harald Frensen, who just wasn't getting to grips with the car and just turning out not to be as hot in single seaters as he was in sports cars. But still, somehow Williams won the double, the drivers and the constructors. But it makes you wonder if that European Grand Prix had gone slightly differently. You know, Schumacher was slowing down, but like I say, it's one to revisit. Moving on into 1998, not only had Williams lost Nui, they'd also lost Renault, resorting to using rebadged 1997 engines, as did Benetton come to think of it. There was also the big rebrand as the title sponsor Rothmans decided to promote its Winfield brand instead of the iconic blue and white, which on TV in those days meant you couldn't tell the difference between Ferrari or Williams. The FW20 was underpowered and was pretty much the same car as the previous year, modified to comply with the new rules regarding the track, which had been reduced to 5 foot 11 inches from 6 foot 7 inches, and also the groove tyres. Both Benetton and Williams, who were the two Renault teams, started to slip down the field, with Williams not being anywhere near as competitive as they had been before. Newey's McLaren MP413 was the car to beat, and Ferrari had really started to gel with Schumacher and the guys he brought over from Benetton, meaning it was still a two-horse race for the title, only it was between a silver and a red car, as opposed to a blue and a red car. Well, a red and a red car as it was now. Two disappointing seasons would follow in 1998 and 1999, but things started to pick up again thanks to three letters buying a stake in Frank's team. B. M. W. So then, a little bit of a fact file, a spotlight, a retrospective, whatever you want to call it, on a car, this time being the Williams FW19, because I talk all the time about the events, but I very rarely talk about the actual cars that were part of those events. So if it's something that you've learned here today, or just had your memory jogged, or you think, oh, that was a very pretty car for the time, then do give the video a thumb up. If you want to see more like this and you're not already, get subscribed and also get that bell on so you never miss out on a future video. Massive thanks as ever to the good folk of Patreon, and if you want to join in with the support as a buy up images, then you can help support the channel by following the link in the description or just joining the Discord chatter and my socials, which are also down in the description box too. So until next time, I've been Ada Mild. Have a cracking day wherever you live in the world, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.